So, uh, hello, Stephen. Uh, good to see you. Hi there, everybody out there. This is actually the second part of our discussion sessions on how to end the crisis, the corona crisis. In the first part, we had Professor Yanir Bayam here last week, who explained an exit strategy from the scientific perspective. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Duckett from Australia, who is an expert in many things, but in particular, in creating scientific sound public policies, or in other words, as I would like to say, turning science into life. Uh, Stephen was, and this one of the key advices uh, for the Australian strategy out of this crisis. He's an expert in both economy and public health. Uh, indeed, he actually was departmental secretary of human services and health in the 90s, in uh, 94, if I remember correctly, for the government of Australia. And he's currently head of the health at the Gratham Institute and advises as such the government in its course of the crisis. I myself, Professor Matthias Schneider, head of the medical and biological physics department at the Technical University of Dortmund in Germany. Stephen, thank you so much for finding time, of course, for us over here. We need you guys urgently. We need to learn from you and we need to learn fast because I think it comes with no surprise for you. Germany and large parts of Europe as the US are in terrible shape. So my first question is, how is life in Australia today? Uh, well, last night um, I went out for dinner. Uh, we uh, sat on the, on the balcony outside at the restaurant. There were people sitting inside. It was, to all intents and purposes, life as normal. Um, now, uh, if I got up from the table, I had to put a mask back on. Uh, I went there on the tram, I had to wear a mask on the tram, but other than that, it was life as normal. So that is one of the benefits of getting to zero or close to zero, that uh, life returns to normal in the normal things that people do. So it's not only that you are, you are in the summertime right now compared to Germany, which is in the middle of the winter, but you, more importantly, you can basically live a free life. Uh, I want to come into to the uh, question that, you know, you've been one of the key advisors, as I said, for the government of Australia for the roadmap out of the corona crisis. So to start with a simple question, what is the best way out of the crisis from your experience? So, it, you know, I was just one of many people who are working on this. But the first point, point is the political leadership has to acknowledge that there is a problem and they have to acknowledge that you've got to do something about it. Now, this is in stark contrast with the United States where President Trump was in total denial. It's in stark contrast with a number of countries where they have an implicit herd immunity strategy. That is, let the disease rip. And, you know, they're not really doing anything about it. In the United Kingdom, for example, I think contact tracing has collapsed so that it's just the disease is just uh, spreading. So the first thing is to acknowledge there's a problem and actually to say, we've got to do something about it. We just can't sit by and let it all happen. And that's, that's big. It may sound small, but it's big and it's not happening everywhere. Secondly, is to set your targets and be explicit with the public, to involve the public in what you're doing and why you're doing it and where you're going. And in Australia, uh, we looked overseas and saw in Italy the the tragedy of the health system being overwhelmed back then in February, March. And that I think galvanised the Australian public to say, we don't want that to happen here. This is okay. not gonna happen here. And so there was a commitment from the Australian public that they would accept that they were going to have to have restrictions on what we could do. And they were, tough sometimes and very tough other times and now they're not there anymore really and except for for mask wearing uh, essentially so, so would you say the way you got the people on board because you can't pull it off without the people was like a clear strategy clear motivation a clear plan kind of uh, it, it, the, the government has to have a social license from the public to do these things we don't you know we're a democracy we don't want to have people telling us to do things that you know that are unnecessary and so on but what happened here in Victoria, for example, is the Premier every day, every day, had a press conference at 11 o'clock in the morning where he'd say, these are the numbers, these are how many deaths, 
this is what we're doing, this is where it's happened. And the public was watching that all the time because they knew that more cases, more deaths is just not where we wanted to be. Right. And a very common response that would come from public that we had here and we're still battling is was, that as you are an expert at studied health and economy, what would you give to that response, the trade off between health and economy? So you, you know, you kind of either you have uh, to make, you have to choose. Yeah, well, we know the answer to that. There is no trade off. We're, right. And you can see it in, in different ways. There have been studies internationally which say the countries which have the lowest deaths have had the least impact on their gross domestic product. And that's pretty logical when you think about it, that, you know, you, you want people, you've got to have people to buy things and so on. But you also see it locally here. We saw that as soon as the restrictions came off, the economy bounced back fairly quickly, very quickly indeed. Okay. And so the, the suppression, the, the restrictions certainly shut the economy down, slowed it down a lot, didn't slow it down totally because obviously people have to go out and buy groceries and so on. There was a lot of restrictions, but as soon as the restrictions came off, the economy bounced back very quickly. And we saw exactly the same thing happen in New Zealand. We saw exactly the same thing happen in Western Australia where their, their economy actually grew in, in 2020. Uh, so um, the evidence both here locally and in international studies is there is no trade-off between the economy and public health. What is right for public health is right for the economy and, and we shouldn't assume that there is such a trade-off because there is not. Okay. That's a, it's immense. So, I mean, if, I mean, it makes total sense what you're saying and you're speaking from experience on top of all this, but it really blocked the minds and the conversations here significantly. I, I was really... But, you know, the, they, they, you can just look around. While the virus is circulating the community, people are anxious and they are uncertain. And they, and they don't go out and buy. They, you know, and activity reduces anyway. And so it's better to get that over and done with as quickly as possible. For, and for people who have a goal to fight for, right, to know the end of the line. You know, here it was a strong, if not even a, a polarizing controversy at the beginning in the society. How to tackle the disease from, you know, you mentioned the spectrum from all the way from complete ignorance, sacrificing the population of the elderly, to put it bluntly. To the so-called zero COVID approach, also Yanir Bayam, who we had on last year, is pushing already since January. So how did the public respond when Australia first announced, okay, this is the way we do it. We go for zero now. I'm sure there must be some controversy. And I would just, now that you are over with, I would just, has some of this controversy resolved? Has the, so to say, the, the splitting in the population healed? Okay, could you? Yeah. So when we first started, um, people thought it was not possible to get to zero. It was just not in the mindset. When the government did its first modelling, they didn't ask the modellers to think about how on earth you get to zero. Um, and it was all about so-called suppression. Well, there was some herd immunity, but it was very, you know, not in Australia, we didn't have the herd, we didn't really have herd immunity people, but it was mainly suppression. Just control the spread of the virus so that you control the health system impact. As long as the health system can cope, we don't, that's all we, that's the best we can hope for. It wasn't until a couple of months into the virus that people realised that especially in an island country like Australia, you can actually get to zero. And what happened in Australia was we saw New Zealand got to zero. We saw a number of states in Australia got to zero. Western Australia, which is the western half of the continent, essentially got to zero fairly quickly. Tasmania, South Australia. Queensland, all got to zero. And so it then became, it was actually possible and we could see it. We could actually see it had occurred, not only, and in addition, there were Asian countries that got to zero as well. So we, we could actually see in our own backyard that you could get to zero. And that changed the debate. So people found it much harder to say, oh no, it's impossible to get to zero because you could see you could get to zero. And so um, there were still debates about that. There's still debates about how strict restrictions should be. And it's obviously not the case if you, that it's just an on-off switch, restrictions or no restrictions. The restrictions can be graduated, and they are. And so 
we've had a breach of quarantine here uh, in Australia in the last couple of weeks, which has caused some community spread. Now that hasn't caused us to go back into lockdown. What it's caused us to do is to go back to wearing masks all the time indoors and also really ramping up contact tracing and testing. You know, in, in Victoria has a population of 5 million or so people and we did, uh, I think, 20,000 tests yesterday. And so, you know, there's a lot of testing going on because the virus is spreading uh, again, but there are only three new cases yesterday. So it's, it's not out of control. And, and that's the message, I guess, about aiming to zero. You get to zero and there's always a risk that you'll have another outbreak. But once you're at zero, it's much easier to control. It's much easier to have graded restrictions that slow the virus, but get into contact tracing. And whereas in the United Kingdom, where 50,000 new cases a day, you can't possibly do contact tracing. It's just overwhelming the system. It's like the comparison that Yanya always makes with the firefighters, right? You control a couple of little fires, it's uh, much easier to control than if the entire city is in flames. And uh, yeah. yeah, and so you've got to get the entire city under control first, and then the spot fires even fix. Exactly, which will be there anyway. So we just have the city and the spot fires otherwise, right? So when you announced your plan, you also announced, I mean, I saw the nice sheets you had, like some certain goals um, that you have, you had clear goals that need to be reached. Could you maybe give an example or yeah. like so, how, how this whole process went down? So the, the first stage was just getting the spread under control. As you know, the virus, increases exponentially uh, and then the lockdowns, the restrictions occurred and the virus started to <laughs> drop off. The new cases dropped off somewhat negative exponentially, not quite. But, and so th there are lots and lots of cases as the virus got under control and so on. And people then began to be, I guess, anxious. You know, when are we going to get out of this? When are we going to get out of this? And so we argued, and the government accepted, that we argued that you've got to have clear goals to, to motivate the public and to involve the public. And as I said earlier, the Premier every day announced a number of new cases. And then the Premier said, well, we now have a clear goal. We're aiming for zero. And between now where we are now and zero, there are going to be four stages. And the stages are going to be based on the average number of cases over the previous two weeks. And so that became the metric that everybody watched. Okay. And if we got below five, this is what would happen. If we got to zero, this would what happen. If we got to zero active cases at all, this is what would happen. And so there was a series of stages which were very clear uh, quantitative targets um, that applied separately for metropolitan Melbourne and the rest of Victoria. And... And these were the stages and everybody knew and everybody was watching and hoping that the numbers would get down, the average number of cases would get down and sometimes they'd bounce up a little bit and sometimes they'd bounce down. And, and once we got to an average of less than five, uh, the first restrictions came off and you could do more and go out more and so on. So um, it, it involved the public and it was very clear and scientifically based. The evidence now is, is very clear. And, and I, I think you mentioned earlier, there's something I want to uh, draw attention to. This is not Australia doing this and everybody else doing this. It is an international effort. And we use the science that was developed in England and United States to actually, you know, help us understand what works and what we can do. And so we were drawing on everybody else's knowledge to actually implement it here. And I think it is a global effort um, that we're not in this alone. And I guess just like you just said that you have had some cooperativity basically that you know one state would see it worked in another state which brought the evidence also and also maybe the power to the, the energy of trying it yourself. You could have this of course on a country level a much larger level so Germany could get inspired from Australia now <laughs> that we could do it and then maybe Bavaria starts and then the other states in, in Germany might do that. So I, I, I can totally see that it's like almost a cooperative like a phase transition kind of effect. And, and did the people also understand i imagine there's one thing that you know because they had to fight hard or you know go on lockdown to get to, to those low numbers 
did they completely understand then? Okay, now we have to open up carefully in order not to um, to risk what we have. I won't say it was it was completely plain sailing. There were obviously um, some of the the media was totally opposed to this strategy, um, and some was not. You know, in basically the paper I read, front page always had the numbers there, and it was by and large supportive of the government strategy. Um, but some media was totally opposed and. The premier's name is Dan Andrews and dictator Dan and, you know, it was all, so it was not, it's a democracy. I mean, people have different views, yeah. but um, the government's polling um, never went below 50% support. Mm -hmm. I think it might've gone down to 48 or something, but really strong support because the, the, they were, the public was brought along and they could see the benefits. And did you see a, some, a, eventually a switch there that, that more and more people yeah. like got attracted or? Yeah gone back up again it's, 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 you know, and so. in, in queensland in queensland they had a, a state election um late last year and there were bitter controversies in queensland because they shut the border to que queensland shut its border uh to new south wales and victoria and um in queensland there's a lot of tourism and uh so this impacted the tourist industry a lot of criticism of shutting the border but they were really strong in the face of quite strong pressure and compassionate stories and so on, very strong on shutting the border. I was prohibited to go to a meeting in Queensland. So I was one of the ones they said, nah, you're a risk, you can't come here. But at the election, the government won an overwhelming victory because the opposition had been opposed to the closing of the border and the public knew that closing the border protected them and they wanted a government that protected them and actually was serious about managing the pandemic. Okay, so, so it's almost like uh, the division, initial division, or if, the, if you want to call it a division or a controversy, healed and brought, brought the oh, country yeah. back together. Oh, yeah. Because that's good to hear. A lot of people are afraid that like, but making such clear, uh, such a clear strategy will split the country and then the one part will run, run to the right, you know, to the right-wing parties and uh, will be lost forever. But uh, but at least uh, you made the experience that they all came back together. Kind so, of, uh, the, the in South a democracy. Yeah, the South Australian government's a more right-wing government. New South Wales government's a more right-wing government. Tasmania's more right-wing government. Both Tasmania and South Australia took very strong stands, closing their borders early. Okay. Okay. And um, they've, uh, you know, the popularity of those governments, they're not extreme right as, as they have in some those, countries. But those, those were the ones I meant. I meant, so I meant the ones all the way on the right. Oh, but yeah, yeah. We, don't, we don't have much of that. We have a bit. Yeah. We have those newspapers too. But, you, you have yeah. too much, many of them. But so, but it's good to hear that this uh, initial controversy or division kind of didn't didn't stick, uh, basically forever at least. This, uh, when I, if I can ask you another question, a, a worry that that exists over here is uh, keeping the numbers down. You know, the usual response is, you know, you're never going to keep the numbers down. The, you know, things pepper in, come over the borders, and it's going to spike again. And uh, so, how do you avoid new cases coming in without shutting down the country? Or and and what do you do about travels? I mean, you already mentioned it, but maybe I. Maybe you can. So yeah, it, so we Australia is a country which has a lot of tourism. Although most of our tourism is internal tourism, that uh, Australians go travelling within Australia. Um, so the internal border controls were significant, but we've uh, shut the external borders, and you can only come in uh, if you're an Australian citizen, essentially, uh, or an Australian resident, um, and you have to have two weeks quarantine when you arrive. So my daughter was studying in London and came back to Australia for Christmas and she had to spend two weeks in quarantine uh, in a hotel in Sydney um, as part of that. And that's accepted. Um, obviously, we want to lift the, there's, there's discussion about uh, creating travel bubbles that say New Zealand is COVID free, so we could have a, a fr free uh, interchange with New Zealand. And so I think well, there's, there's going to be more of that. Um, but I think we're going to be have travel restrictions for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And within Australia? We've had a few, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, a couple of spikes, but uh, essentially the borders reopened. They've come back down again. The border control is back in place now, but it'll go back up again by mid-January. But if there would be an outbreak right now in one of the states, you would shut that state, that borders? Yeah, that, that's, there's, there's been a couple of outbreaks in New South Wales, Victoria, and the border 
to the Victorian New South Wales border has been closed and I had to cancel my holiday that I was going for in, in New South Wales uh, oh. this week. Yeah. I should feel that's, bad that's, for you, but I don't. <laughs> that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. COVID, you have a COVID-free summer, so I can't feel bad for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about it. Uh, let me get to the second before last question. Uh, it's a, a very heated discussion from the beginning was here, the opening of schools, daycare centers and so on. Of course, you know, we understand closed schools have tremendous impact on all the working parents, uh, however, open schools without restrictions are presumably, uh, well, at least a significant, if not one of the most, uh, uh, one of the really strong driving forces of the spread. So how did you deal with uh, schools and daycare centers and uh, how are you, what are your experiences um, in retrospect? Essentially schools were closed except, except for essential workers, the children of essential workers. And so the vast majority of kids and university students had were online mm -hmm. uh, for all of 2020. So our school year, academic year, is the calendar year, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so for most of 2020, these kids were studying at home mm -hmm. uh, with their parents looking after them and watching mm -hmm. them and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had all the results come out uh, for the, the final exams for the end of the school year 12, the the school ending period and the newspapers read like it's it's normal you know okay. people actually did very well now don't forget the, the the university entrance and the like is all about relativities and so everybody was impacted more or less the same mm -hmm. um some less than others but you know the the school rankings that we typically see are very similar to what we've seen in previous years so so um in an amazing effort Mm -hmm. by both teachers mm -hmm. um, who pivoted to online parents and the kids themselves it it uh, it, it worked and it, uh, it looks like it's not having a, a long-term impact okay and, and, the, and the particular small kids did you have any special yeah we uh, had yeah the primary schools were also closed um the state government here has announced a catch-up program for the for the primary school kids uh so they're putting in extra resources, extra tutoring uh, to help um, especially disadvantaged uh, kids, disadvantaged schools who might not have had the same privileges as the wealthier schools to um, get over the, the, the problems of uh, the, the, the less adequate schooling. But, you know, the, the, there's a catch up occurring in the start of the next school year. Um, and as I said, um, it, it, it seems like we're weathered that storm. Oh, that's, that's good to know. And and as you as you relaxed the restrictions and more and more pe pe uh, parents would go back to work, was there any kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of support for working parents? Or so, you know, when people would go back to work, what would it do with the kids at home, so to say? What so, as I said, for essential workers, um, there was uh, right, the, said, schools, the schools were open for essential workers. Okay. Um, that was tightly defined. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, so there are lots of parents who, who experience homeschooling. Okay, excellent, excellent. I hope they will stay closed here now too. We are, we are in lockdown right now and they're going to decide on Tuesday whether we uh, remain in lockdown, which is, uh, of course, I'm all, I have my hopes up for it uh, with a strategy, hopefully then. I come to my last question, which would be, in your opinion, the most dangerous misconceptions at the moment outside of Australia. If you are sitting in Australia, you see what happened. You know the facts. You know how science worked and, uh, and it did work. You have it in front of you. You look to Europe or the US. Um, what you, would you reply to those people who say zero COVID can't be reached? I know you mentioned it already, but maybe you want to give a message there too. Yeah, our experience, we know it can. You just got to set the goal and take the actions that will get you there. It's not no point saying, oh, we want to get rid of COVID, blah, blah. You've actually got to do things. And those do things are pretty obvious when you think about it. The evidence is now very clear. You know, mask wearing is good. Restrictions on the number of people in indoors and outdoors. You know, ventilation is good. And, and so there are a series of things that, that you need to, to put in place. And if you do that, as we have shown, you can get there. 
Have, have you be, ever been asked um, why why you don't simply wait for the vaccine? Or what did you respond if you have been asked? Um, well, every, you know, when these decisions were being taken, which was the middle of this, the middle of 2020, it wasn't clear if and when the vaccine would, would come. And secondly, it wasn't clear what the vaccine will do. So we know the evidence is that the vaccine protects those who've been vaccinated and reduces the symptoms if they are infected. We don't know yet whether it protects transmission. Mm -hmm. um, typically a vaccine does protect transmission, mm -hmm. but we've got no idea, we've got no evidence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, waiting for a vaccine to fix this, it's only going to fix part of it. It's not yeah. going to fix all of it. How I discussed in the discussion with Janiel last week, that is a kind of a, we are playing with evolution there, right? The more infections you have, you get mutations, like see what happened in the UK. All of a sudden you have a higher transmission. Next next time, maybe you have something more deadly, which drives the numbers for herd immunity up and all this kind of things, which means you will need more vaccine. So it's like- And also you don't know how long the vaccine works. I mean, yeah. you do know that if you're, if you're naturally infected, uh, you, you remain protected for three months, four months, maybe five, but you, you know, will the vaccine be better than that? Right. It's a dangerous yeah. game to play. Stephen, I want to give you the chance, or not more, more the chance, I want to give us the chance to, uh, to make a final, kind of a final statement, a message that you want to, what do you want to tell the world? I think, I think there are two couple of messages. First, the science is evolving very quickly and it's an international endeavour. It's a global endeavour. We're learning from each other. And secondly, we should continue to do that. We should learn from each other. We could also involve not only what happens in the lab, but also what happens in real life. That in real life, here in Victoria, we achieve zero. You can too. You mean I could have said it much better, but uh, so let, me, let me close and let me thank you so much again for giving us this wonderful perspective, how bringing the numbers down and keeping them down can brought into real life. It's just basically what you said. I completely agree. It was uh, really good to have you as an expert in health and economy. I think it helps hopefully that people see it's such a scientist saying that both can win health and economy. Uh, you are someone from inside, you know how, how these policies have been made. You have seen them coming into life and you have seen them especially how they've been implemented so successfully. Listen up soccer fans in Germany that soccer stadiums are filled in Australia again. So this is a, this is a, this might give some power to the people of of course, there are many details left to be discussed. And uh, as you said, I, um, there are skepticism out there and some rules can be easily transferred to other countries. Uh, some rules would be hard to transfer, need to be modified. I think the important point is that you said, I can just repeat that, that there are uh, countries out there which have done it. So we know it can be done and we have to uh, bring those people together like scientists, politicians and people like you, Stephen. I think you, uh, from my perspective, at least here in Germany, you are a key ingredient that people have not thought about it so far to bring somebody in who knows it, you know, who knows that it works and who knows it from inside. So hopefully very soon we will bring all those powers together on the same table. Until then, stay safe. All the best. Thank you so much from my home into yours and, uh, and a happy new 21, Stephen. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Matthias. Thank you.